Ah, welcome everyone. All coming into the temple. The freedom of being in the temple. Marvelous thing. So, um, here we are, feeling the time. We'll just start by just, this is it, like what we have. And there's wonder in every moment of being alive. So, um, let's have it. I'll just start there the meditation with the bell. This is our first pre-meditation. <laughs> Just signaling the musicians. <laughs> is there a difference between pre-meditation and meditation? I don't think so. The temple bell. The ancient sound. Feeling the time. Just arriving here. Oh, actually, we've already arrived. What about that? Here we are. Enjoying this life. Feeling the time, feeling the season.
Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Something heavenly about the music floating through the temple. <clears throat> so yeah, so here we are. Um, marvelously here. And uh, I, I decided to talk for, f to pick up some curriculum cons. There's a curriculum in cons and traditional curriculum. It's, it's kind of, you can do it differently, but there's an ancient set of cons that you use to awaken. And then after you've awakened, um, <clears throat> then you awaken more with more of them. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it's, which is rather nice. It's like there's more ice cream where the ice cream came from. The, <laughs> but the, um, uh, and so, uh, and last week we did the goose in the bottle, which is like, it's own marvelous thing, you know, it's about how sometimes something just pops out, something gets freeze itself really. And uh, this week we have you are hanging from a branch by your teeth. Your arms cannot reach a branch. Your feet cannot find the trunk. Then someone below the tree asks, appears below the tree and asks you, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? If you do not answer, you fail in your responsibility and your duty. If you do answer, you lose your life. What will you do hanging from a branch by your teeth? And you can tell just from the, you know, the lunacy of the situation, you know, um, <clears throat> how much, like, how much, like, it's, you know, you just entering a predicament fully, entering the dangerous situation of being alive. <laughs> Anything could happen. Somebody could come to you and ask you, why did Buddy Dharma come from the West? And meanwhile, you're trying to cook or give birth or whatever, whatever you're doing and uh, finish your university PhD paper. You know, many things you could be doing fix the plumbing and somebody says why did Bodhidharma come from the West the, the, the question itself was like for hundreds of years people would just ask this and I think it was more like what can I ask the teacher you know and so people say well why don't you ask him why did Bodhidharma come from the West and what is it all about what's the teaching all about things like that you know the very first time I was in a longish retreat, like a month-long retreat with a major teacher, uh, actually I didn't ask any questions because I didn't know what to do. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any questions to ask. I was just trying to subject myself to the experience. And so it's... Um, it's a true thing, not knowing what question to ask, knowing that you have all questions, but no specific one. So why did Bodhidharma come from the West? And here you are, you know, hanging, your arms are waving, your feet can't find anything. And the whole situation doesn't seem sustainable. So it's like, and every time I look at my life, every time I look at everybody's life, it's, Linji said, we can't stay here long. And so, one of the solutions, you know, obviously, is to relish it, you know, when we're really in it. The, um, there's a, I like to leave the windows open so we can hear the birds and think, but today there's a, there's a, a place which we can't see, but it was, is in earshot next door that's owned by a soap opera star. Um, it was used to be owned by some, like, really sweet, gay guys from San Francisco, but now it's owned by a soap opera star and her angry English husband. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, but they're never there because they live in London or wherever they live. And so they, <clears throat> occasionally they rent it out and it's a complicated legal thing that I don't know anything about. But 
Anyway, there's a woman rents the place every about every, maybe she's their mother, I don't know, every couple of months, and she does nothing, and if we start hearing her, she amplifies her voice and talks on the telephone, and you never hear her pause, so the other person, <laughs> the other person is clearly, I don't know, a servant, a slave, a dog, I don't know who's on the other, other line, end of the line, but or whether they protest. And um, uh, and uh, we have a megaphone. I, one of the things, you know, and it's one of those things that's just in your consciousness. It's like, you know, and uh, and then I thought, I remembered Gurdjieff had this thing about there were always really annoying people in any spiritual community. And Gurdjieff used to make sure there was always somebody really annoying, always there. <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise people would, you know, I don't know, it worked for that. And Alison said today, well, I could, we have a megaphone left over from my daughter's Burning Man people. And she said, I could sort of, I could start, I could do a theater piece and call her back <laughs> with the megaphone. Because you can't even, it's a long locked driveway. You can't, you can't ever meet the person or talk to them. Really. And, and, uh, and I thought, well, then I thought of Gurdjieff and I thought, she's probably good for us in some secret way. There's some karma being worked out. So. <laughs> we'll see, next time she comes, we'll see if I weaken. But uh, <laughs> but so so there's that sort of wonderful thing about all these little precipices we're hanging from, you know. And the hanging, the, you know, the hanging from, a hanging from a tree is an ancient image, you know, Odin died on a tree in Norse mythology and hanging on the tree for I think three days and three nights maybe or a week I can't remember now um, but uh, but he was hanging yeah maybe three days three nights and after that he got you know he had vision and uh, psychic powers and of course um, then you have Jesus hanging on the cross um, and so there's a there's a big thing about humans and trees, you know, a great archetype. This one is just a predicament. It's like <laughs> you just hear, and you can tell some predicaments you can maybe do something about. And this one, it's not going to last long. Yeah. So so uh, so to have it and feel it, I think, is the thing which Gurdjieff understood with them. With with his uh, keeping the irritating person around, you know, <laughs> who's irritating? I'm irritating. That's the thing. <laughs> so <laughs> it's my being irritating. And so I thought of, and I was thinking of things, and there's a lot of um, maybe I'll read a Louise Gluck poem later about that moment, uh, one of those moments. But um, I was thinking about long ago. Um, I, I put this in an article once, but I couldn't find it, so I decided I'll just tell the story again. And um, the um, thinking about just the perilous and lunatic quality of life, and so I was working on an old uh, wooden trawler up on Barrier Reef, and we'd be along the top right-hand edge of Australia and then out into the Coral Sea and, and, uh, and things like that. New Caledonia places like that, and uh, but this time we we had we had found prawns down south of where we were, and and I, I was on this old fishing boat, and the old fishing boat had been hand built and had a lot of quirks, and the old um, the old uh, guy who built it thirty years before was pretty old, and so I was the deckhand, and I was supposed to do the physical things, you know, but it, it was a little bit of a comedy show because yeah. so, so, he would uh, he was incredibly good at finding prawns but then he'd he'd lose them he couldn't and so I say well I'll drive I can I can find I know where they were I'm just looking at that patch of ocean I'm sure it hasn't moved so, so, I, and so I'd take the wheel and then he'd drop the nets and so then I'd put us right over the prawns and then I said what happened and the, the nets would drop but he wouldn't drop them far enough and so there was he had this ditzy quality you know about him <coughs> and he was also the guy who thought he could predict the wind which he could do very successfully tomorrow but by the direction the milky way was pointing because the wind blew the milky way around up 
up there before it blew the Milky Way, or before it blew down here. So up in the heavens, it was already blowing. And uh, so you could tell his um, thinking processes were different. <laughs> so, so anyway, but I had learned to, oh, he'll know where prawns are and he knows which way the wind's going to blow. Don't ask the reasons. You know? <laughs> so anyway, I'm sailing with him and uh, but it wasn't really a problem. We, were, we had a load and we were wallowing in a cross sea and a big... Big storm was coming in. We wanted to get in before the storm. And we didn't think it was super dangerous, but it wasn't like a hurricane. We didn't think, but it wasn't good. And uh, and then we come across this guy I know called well, Duck was his nickname, I think. And uh, and he was a character, and he had all sorts. Of, he always had like interesting troubles. Like he had been very successful. He'd been like a house painter or something. He'd been very successful and bought another boat on credit but it turned out to be a problem and <coughs> his two boats were tied up together in the big new fancy expensive boat with a big uh, mortgage and suddenly he and his friend jumped off it and it exploded and burnt to the waterline and sank <laughs> and there were many questions about what happened to cause it to explode <laughs> and he had such financial troubles he had to he had to um so he was always hanging from a branch by the teeth. He had to, he hocked his guitar to get gas, fuel for his, his other boat. And uh, and there's a well-known trick of the tides were very strong. And so if you let go in the dark on the outgoing tide, nobody would know you'd left. They never, wouldn't hear an engine start. So you let go of the chains. And we did this to stop people following us to the grounds we were going to. So. But anyway, we're coming back and, and here's this guy with his, and he's got a load of prawns. So he's, he's safe from having his boat taken from him <laughs> so so, uh, so he's happy but he's taken up he's put naturally he's overloaded the boat because he didn't want to give up a single prawn and um and the cockpit there's a cockpit a well in the back of the boat and uh and it, if wave comes in it should drain out quickly but he wasn't with him and so he's standing up to his waist in water and the bow's up and the stern's down. Fortunately, the engine was still going. So <laughs> the propeller's underwater. And uh, <coughs> and we can't go in, but not too far because we don't want to get grounded or anything. And uh, and he and my skipper are talking over the two-way. And um, and he's um, my skipper's trying to decide whether he should send me across to swim across to help, you know. And, uh, and I'm looking there. You get visible sharks in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm standing on the, and I'm thinking about getting home and like that maybe we'll, we'll be rich for about a week with this load, of <laughs> that sort of thing. And I'm holding on to this big gallows and standing on the on the railing, so like for a better view and watching the waves and the sharks and this guy and is he sinking or not and is he going to get out of it and and uh, and everybody's like really concerned and um, and then I realise wait, we're having a wonderful time. <laughs> we're, we're all in the midst of life. This is, this is it. There's nothing could be better right at this moment. You know? and, uh, and in the end, I think the guy, because he was a little worried that I might claim some sort of, I don't know, want to be paid or something like that. So he turned us down, eventually hobbled home to port somehow. And came home, he was, I heard he came in some hours after us with, with, with most of his load intact, you know. <laughs> duck <laughs> so i thought that's uh you know we have a lot of those hanging by your branch from the teeth moments and uh there isn't you know there isn't a known perfect solution in that case we didn't really need to be concerned you know and uh i'm sure he got into some other trouble and lost that boat eventually too but i don't remember that story so but, but there's something marvelous about just being at the edge of life you know, at the edge of life. Here's, um, this is Louis, 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 Louis Jenkins, who's um, not a great poet, perhaps, but a great imagination. It's called Indecision. People died or moved away and did not return. Things broke and were not replaced. At one time he owned a car and a telephone, no more. And yet somehow things did not become more simple. <laughs> then one night, roused from sleep, he stepped out naked into the below zero winter night, into the clear midnight and 20 billion stars. 
Nothing stirred, not a leaf, nothing out there, not the animal self, not the bird-brained self. Not a breath of wind, yet somehow the door slammed shut, locking behind him and knocking the kerosene lantern to the floor. Suddenly the whole place was afire. What to do? Should he try to make the mile-long run through the woods, over hard-crusted snow to the nearest neighbour, or just stick close to his own fire and hope someone would see the light? The cabin was going fast. Flames leaped high above the bare trees. <laughs> That's certainly a predicament. <laughs> and so, and I think that I've been thinking about the thing about Cohen's is that, you know, one of the things we do, um, I was talking to a guy yesterday who's in that kind of predicament and, and uh, I think he's realized his life is unsustainable and he wants me to tell him how to continue it anyway. And, um, uh, and he's a teacher, you know, and he, he just thinks he does this good work and nothing's working actually really, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he wants to keep doing it instead of, you know, sometimes you just want to keep driving on this road even though it's plainly you've gotten off the right road and you're running into fences and things. And so he's like that. And I thought, oh, that's very human. You know, that's a human thing to do. That, that, And he just wanted me to give him an answer to get out of it, really, you know, and to get out of the problem. How do I... How do I change the problem without changing my me, you know, without changing my soul? And so the common thing is to, well, why not immerse yourself in the problem, turn towards, immerse yourself in the problem. And the lunacy of the problem is really the lunacy of life, you know, the lunacy of the hanging, hanging by the, your teeth from a branch. And the, um, and, uh, and if we plunge into the situation, you know, if that situation, my jaw's hurting, my arms are, <laughs> my arms are flailing, you know, um, and uh, and it doesn't make any sense because you know, if my jaws are clasped to something, you'd think my arms should find something, but no, it doesn't make sense. It's not what we were told makes sense. So there's that that beauty of that, and so um, so. One of the things Zen does says, well, let the predicament come to you. Let the koan come to you. Let that a koan is sort of like a... Uh, originally, everybody thought it was a gadget and you sort of applied it to the mind. It was like a can opener or, or you know, you wore things away or something like that. And, you know, I definitely tried those ideas on, but that never made sense, really. And, and uh, so I was never quite convinced. And I think it's more like it's a place, it's something that matches you. And if you move around in it, you discover these these um, things that you wouldn't discover, you know, otherwise, you know. And uh, which is what Gurdjieff's thing about the irritating lady next door who's, who's got an amplified conversation, comes up from the city to have an amplified conversation all day on her <laughs> telephone. <laughs> So that's kind of like hanging from a branch by your teeth. And, uh, and so there's this wonderful thing that you turn towards and suddenly it becomes amusing, or like the, me hanging from the gallows of the um, fishing boat and, and the boat's rolling, like really rolling in the cross well and slow over and slow back and things like that. And, and uh, Ah, oh, this is the perfect life. <laughs> so, so that's what it's like, you know. This is the perfect life. Whatever you have right now, whatever your predicament right now, if you if you look into it, you know. You know, this is a time. This is a, a great momentous time we're living in. I think we all know that, you know. And so I've noticed people's dreams. People have these huge dreams about monsters, and. Uh, so like there was a woman a woman wrote this great book called the third reich of dreams which i mentioned a few times um and who was a psychoanalyst and as soon as hitler got into power she asked all her psychoanalytic friends to record their patients dreams and they had all lost their jobs because hitler didn't like psychoanalysis and thought it was jewish and um 
which, which it kind of was, <laughs> and uh, and uh, thought it and and pernicious and uh, destructive of his plans, which it probably also was, you know. So um, so it became illegal and uh, ended up in concentration camps and things. But while there was time, she asked all her friends to record dreams, and and people had the dreams about the immense catastrophe that was taking over Europe. You know. And I think people are having dreams now about, you know, the difficult, you know, the sorrow of the, you know, and also the amazing, the predicament. We're hanging from a branch by our teeth with, you know, the Thwaites Glacier starting to melt. And so opinions vary from it will raise the ocean two feet or ten feet, <laughs> so, things like that when it goes. Or, and also, what will we do? We all thought liberal democracy was working, and, and what will we do if we lose that? You know? So, uh, which seems pretty touch and go. So, um, and so the, 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 we're in an immense time, so our dreams are going to be immense, and in a way we need koans and meditations that are immense. We can just trust the vastness of meditation because in a time when, like this, you really need to trust the inner work and you need, really need to have it and uh, honor it and have your meditation. We can't use our meditation just to get away from things, but we can use our meditation to have joy in the midst of it more. That's a nice thing, you know, to have joy in the midst of it all is itself a kind of triumph, you know, so, so, um, just to say that, yeah, it's a nice thing. This is a longer poem that I usually read, but it's by a great poet, so I'm hoping I can get away with it. <laughs> this is Louise Gluck, and uh, he's a great person about, I don't know, well, she's a great person about many things. A great person about the movements of the psyche and social groups. So. Midsummer. On nights like these, we used to swim in the quarry, the boys making up games requiring them to tear off the girls' clothes, and the girls cooperating because they had new bodies since last summer, and they wanted to exhibit them, the brave ones leaping off the high rocks, bodies crowding the water. The nights were humid still, the stone was cool and wet, marble for graveyards, for buildings we never that we never saw, buildings in cities far away. On cloudy nights you were blind, those nights the rocks were dangerous, but in another way it was all dangerous, that was what we were after. The summer started, then the boys and girls began to pair off, but always there were a few left at the end. Sometimes they'd keep watch, sometimes they'd pretend to go off with each other like the rest. But what could they do there in the woods? No one wanted to be them, but they'd show up anyway as though some night their luck would change. Fate would be a different fate. At the beginning, at the end though, we were all together. And after the evening chores, after the smaller children were in bed, then we were free. Nobody said anything, but we knew the nights we'd meet and the nights we wouldn't. Once or twice, once or twice, at the end of summer, we could see a baby was going to come out of all that kissing. And for those two, it was terrible, as terrible as being alone. The game was over. We'd sit on the rocks, smoking cigarettes, worrying about the ones who weren't there. Then finally walk home through the fields, because there was always work the next day. And the next day, we were kids again, sitting on the front steps in the morning, eating a peach. Just that, but it seemed an honour to have a mouth. And then going to work, which meant helping out in the fields. One boy work, worked for an old lady building shelves. The house was very old, maybe he maybe built when the mountain was built. And then the day faded. We were dreaming, waiting for night. Standing at the front door at twilight, watching the shadows lengthen. And a voice in the kitchen was always complaining about the heat, wanting the heat to break. Then the heat broke and the night was clear and you thought of the boy or girl you'd be meeting later and you thought of walking into the woods and lying down, practicing all those things you were learning in the water. 
And though sometimes you couldn't see the person you're with, there was no substitute for that person. The summer night glowed, in the field fireflies were glinting, and for those who understand such things, the stars were sending messages. You will leave the village where you were born, and in another country you'll become very rich, very powerful, but you'll always will mourn something you left behind, even though you can't say what it was. And eventually you'll return to seek it. So that's Louise Gluck's um, The Hanging from a Branch by Your Teeth when you're a teenager, but also when you're remembering being a teenager. And uh, what is it, and as, as we get older, what is it we carry with us? And what is it we want? What light do we want to keep? So I think the, you know, for me, uh, I kind of fell into the situation of cons and realized, oh, this is not something to do something with. This is something to be in. Life is not something to do something with. Although, you know, there are good things to do with it. <laughs> but, uh, but it's something to be in. And the vastness is always there accompanying us then. And the, so the sweetness of not pushing life around, but having it come through us and into us. So um, let's meditate again. The koan starts out and, you know, right there, you are, you don't have to know how you got to this planet. <laughs> you are hanging from a branch by your teeth. Your hands can't reach a branch, your feet cannot find the trunk. Someone appears beneath the tree and asks, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? What is the meaning of the great sage bringing meditation and koans? What's that all about? What is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? If you do not answer, you evade your responsibility. If you do answer, you lose your life. What will you do? So, as with any great coin, you don't have to use it for something. Just enter it or let it come over you or let yourself become one with it. And can you feel how vast it is to be in meditation? <laughs> what it's like with the branch between your teeth. <laughs> and also how spacious and how free we are today. Nothing, <clears throat> nothing is needed, everything is complete. And you can feel the completeness, sort of that old saying, it comes out of your own breast and covers heaven and earth, you know. You can feel the completeness is always there. And it's also a kind of vastness that means that things are also kind of transparent, the the thickness of the situation is never as thick as we think, and that's the old philosophical name for that is emptiness. We're different from transience where things fall away. This is just the freedom and the spaciousness inside everything, whether it seems thick or not.
And here we are in the completeness. No matter what we think is going on in our lives, our lives are going on in our lives. <laughs> and life is this marvelous thing. <clears throat> and fighting the demons is all right. Freeing, being free is even better. <laughs> Or being free, if we've got to fight demons, being free while we do it. But we can feel the peace and spaciousness fills us. And that we're already, before the bell starts, we've already started meditating. before we got annoyed by anything, or afraid of anything, or wanted anything, we were already free. And there's a, a kind of happiness that just appears by itself, without being reached for, hanging from a branch by your teeth. <laughs> How wonderful. And some, it's always some, somebody, uh, some innocent, naive person appears and says, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? And you don't really know what they think they're asking with that question. But we realize that all the questions are like that, you know. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> when would I do that? <clears throat> now is a good time. <laughs> Enjoy ourselves. Body Dharma, who <coughs> <clears throat> we might wonder why he came from the West. Bodhidharma, you know, famously, an emperor, the emperor asked him, what is the first principle of the holy teaching? What is the meaning of it? What is the first principle of the holy teaching? And he said, vast emptiness, nothing holy. Um, wasn't quite what the emperor was looking for, probably, but... Um, and nonetheless, the emperor hang, hung in there and said, well, then who are you standing in front of me? And Bodhidharma said, I do not know. And uh, we don't know what happened to the conversation after that, but it, my, I, my imagination is it just sort of quietly everybody forgot about the conversation and, you know, the wave passed over the disturbance and so on. But I do not know, he said, and so... I think it's also true of happiness. We do not know why. You know, I I have this thing where I always wake in the middle of the night and I, I don't know whether it's my fault or not. <laughs> this is the way I was holding my mouth. <laughs> or what? And then Eventually I realized, oh, I seem, I'm kind of awake. And so then I get up and in nice weather, I go outside and sit on the deck and I hear the crickets and 
then they stop and they start up very hesitantly. Cheap, 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 as if they're trying it out again. Then they're in full, full sound. And all that's going on. And then at some stage I notice, oh, I'm really happy. I don't, I've done nothing to deserve it. There's nothing going on. Just being here is a happy experience for a human being, you know, just to be here. That here, thing that covers everything and the way we participate in everything, well, that's called being here. But <laughs> good enough. Um, and Tess Beasley, do you want to say anything? I really like the intimation in this koan that um, nothing further can happen until I let go. And it makes me think of even like falling asleep at night, like whatever ideas I'm still holding or questions I'm still trying to solve or whatever else I might think need to happen. It's like I have to just let go and fall into something else that I don't know. And I don't know where I'll be when I wake up with any of those things. And um, uh, so you were talking about the lunatic quality of things. I had something happen to me yesterday that seems like it belongs to this conversation, which was some friends came up to go out on the lake. We have kayaks and they have paddle boards and they haven't gone in many years because they have a little girl now. And the guy of this couple is um, a pretty tightly wound fellow. He, like, he, he was telling me how even when he was a kid, he'd have all his matchbox cars lined up in his room. And if anyone ever touched one, like his whole world would just come unraveled. But he was wearing this shirt that said Shark Zen. I thought, well, what's that about? But um, okay. And so he lays out paddle boards, which have been perfectly rolled and preserved and in perfect condition. And he gets them all ready to go. And we're all in the water. And immediately one springs a leak. And he, you know, everything goes wrong with the world. You know, these were expensive and I've taken very good care of them and what's going on? And there's a guy who maintains the dock. He said, well, let me call Kevin. I said, well, who's Kevin? Well, he lives right next door and he's usually drunk, but I think he has an extra paddleboard that he'll bring over. <laughs> and he says, well, no, really, it's okay. You know, this was kind of, no, we'll keep hanging here, even though we don't have enough, like, we don't know what to do. No, no, let me call Kevin. So Kevin, the paddleboard is the only way he can get there is um, he lives right next door to the dock and the paddleboard's mostly out of air. So I see him and he does look pretty drunk, straddle the paddleboard with a kayak paddle and start coming toward us. And he, <laughs> he brings it over and we get it pumped up. So we're mostly working out now and now we go to set out and then the other paddle board pff, breaks. And <laughs> this guy, Shark Zen Man, is just like about to come unglued. Nothing is going as planned and nothing's going to plan anyway. But Kevin says, well, I've got another blow up paddle board. It doesn't have a fin, but I'll go get it for you. You know, and we, that's all right, Kevin. No, no, no. And I said, well, can we give you anything for your trouble? No, no, boaters help boaters. And the guy who's running the dock says, just don't get his wife involved. And we said, well, why? And he said, well, his wife gets really drunk and she's bipolar and she'll start screaming at him. And so we have to kind of do this on the, <laughs> we say, okay, okay. And Kevin says, no, no, no. And he's got no shirts. He's pretty drunk. And he says, no, no, it's good. It's good, man. It's good. I said, okay, Kevin. And so we leave and our friend is going to sort out because now we have three apparatus to move on. We have the little girl. We're going to try to make the beach. And we learn, we saw Kevin's wife come out who indeed has tattoos and piercings and a cute little border collie dog. And um, it, it, the whole thing just kept coming off the rails at every possible turn. But we learned that eventually Kevin has said to our friend, who is very uptight, 
you sure you don't need a beer, man? Like, you seem like you just, you want to just come over? <laughs> and our friend says, well, it's super nice, but no, you know, it's, I think I'm okay. And he says, well, you can't keep your, your car keys here because if you get them wet, you know, you, he said, well, you just keep them on my dock. He said, I'm not going to steal your car, man. I got plenty of cars because Kevin and his wife are indeed hoarders <laughs> and you can see it all over their house. And but sure enough, we get both paddle boards, even the one with no fin. We make it across the thing. We have a great time. We come back and the guy sitting at the dock says, well, you know, that's good. I, act I actually gave Kevin those paddle boards and he said I had to move out of my house because my wife has dementia now and she chases me in the middle of the night since I lost my leg. And we said, what? <laughs> He's so but he was so helpful. He said, God bless you guys, you know, just have a good day. And it just was like, had we had any idea what we thought we were supposed to be doing, everything would have been against us. But it turned into just this almost theater piece of an afternoon whereby everything just kept falling apart, but then having this actually much better turn when it came together. So I think, um, by the end, our friend said, you know, yeah, let's go have a beer. Like he was ready to sort of let go, you know? <laughs> so I don't know. Why did Bodhidharma come from the West? Kevin seems to have an idea. I don't know. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Tess. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> um, Jesse, you want to say anything? Yeah, I was at the, I went to the Okanagan uh, County Fair here in Northern Washington yesterday, and I didn't want to go, and, but I went anyway, because I thought that's what I should do. I found out halfway through the hour long drive that actually my wife didn't expect me to go. She thought I wasn't going to go, but I agreed to go, even though I didn't want to go because I thought that she wanted me to go. And so the whole thing is like kind of screwed from the beginning in a way. By the time I found out we were too far to turn around to take me home, but it ended up just feeling like predicament after predicament after, as I'm looking back, when I was there, I didn't notice this, but looking back, it just feels like gate after gate, after gate, after gate. We walked in, walked in through the chain link fence, a little break in the chain link fence and had a little hut set up where you pay the person your 10 bucks and they give you a little bracelet and, is these three older people there manning the gate, they were just incredibly friendly and so happy to see us. And, and I realized like that was, even right there was a little predicament for me. And it all, it's like, it all sets up between these two sort of goalposts about um, just what's true for me and what I think I ought to be doing, whatever it is. Should I smile at the person at the gate? Should I say hello? Should I ask you, how are you doing? Should I say nice day today? Should I, should I, should I, should I? And, um, and then underneath that, the, just the vast well of emptiness, I think. And, and so looking back, I'm just through, as we've been meditating today, I'm just looking at all the points where all those sort of little, little like, I want to call them choice points, but I'm not exactly, I'm not really clear on the, the issue of choice in life. So I don't know if they're choices or not, but all the moments where I ended up taking the path of should do, should do, should do, should do. And I can see that in all of those moments, I was completely free. There's no question whatsoever that there was absolute freedom in all of those moments. But somehow it, I, I relate to that part of my mind that thinks we need to like get things like about that wide, like, like the cat, the, those tunnels that the cattle go down. So they can't go left and they can't go right. They can only go forward and backward. This sort of what it felt like. And um, it's remarkable to look back and see there was no, there was no tunnel. There were no sides to that when this vast, uh, fairground and at some point I got really overwhelmed because I haven't been around that many people in a long time and I don't know if that's why I just got overwhelmed and um, so I told my wife can you take the kid I need to go like just go somewhere where there aren't any people which is hard in a fairground full of people and so I was like wandering around trying to find a place where I could just kind of chill like 
let things inside of me calm down. And, um, and once they, I couldn't actually couldn't ever tell whether they'd calm down or not. There wasn't a point where I went, okay, I feel better now. But there was always this thing about it, like, you should, you should reunite with your people. You should reunite with your people. And so then I like desperately searched for them for 10 or 15 minutes, trying to get myself back in this, like back in the cattle tunnel thing. So I think just to say that, that's a really remarkable thing for me that, that, that I put myself somehow, some part of me puts myself or I find myself, like you said, how do we get a tree? I don't know. I just find myself in these positions where oftentimes it only feels like there are these two, these kind of binary options about do I stay or do I go? Do I smile or not smile? Do I eat or not eat? Do I, and looking back, I can just see the vast freedom in that whole time. So I think that's it. Thank you. There's no limit to shock Zen. <laughs> Sound of the temple bell. The, why did Buddy Dama come from the West? Each sound contains the meaning of our lives. The whole meaning. Not too bad, eh? <laughs> it's all right. It's going to be all right, too. You are hanging from a branch by your teeth. Your hands cannot reach a branch. Your feet cannot find the trunk. Someone appears beneath the tree and asks you, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? If you do not answer, you lose your life. Actually, if you do not answer, you evade your responsibility. <laughs> if you answer, you lose your life. You lose your life either way. <laughs> what will you do? I like that. If you do not answer, you also lose your life. What will you do? For me, you know, I'm happy sitting here to look around the temple and see your faces. to feel the beauty just spreading outwards. There's something about taking our time when we think we have no time, which is not to mind other people's business about their sense of timing or something. It's just what comes like Bodhidharma, vast emptiness, nothing holy. I do not know. It's all right. 
trusting that uncertainty and that mystery. Even here, in the music, just in the meditation, in the great temple we have assembled, there is a vastness and a peace. And here is where it always is. Hanging from a branch by our teeth, wondering what to say to the earnest student who hasn't quite noticed what we're doing, <laughs> how we might be occupied. <laughs> Why did Bodhidharma come from the West? And the 
the sweetness and the vastness just spreads out from here. There's no one who does not have it. And no matter what <clears throat> somebody's done or what you think about what they've done, there's no one who doesn't have this, this joy. Even <laughs> like that term, shark sandals. <laughs> it's like you're completely so. Could I get, you know, when you're lost, get more lost. <laughs> so, yeah, good enough. Hanging from a branch by our teeth. Completely free. Just feeling the silence, you know. When we can get this quiet, it's a marvelous thing. It's like the whole world, the birds feel it, the traffic feels it. In the midst of all the noise, there's quiet. The woman next door has stopped talking on her amplified telephone, stopped shouting. <laughs> The world is at peace, <laughs> and it already was. <laughs> sometimes feel like last night was that I sometimes feel oh, I can just never get enough of the the sweetness or the the vastness. As soon as I start reaching for things and explaining them and wondering what the meaning is, <clears throat> it's just here, you know. And there's a loving, intimate quality. And we can see that everybody has it, you know. It's not far to reach, you know. We don't have much time left, but Alison, do you have any... The other two, the two stories we already heard were so... Yeah, I was thinking about what constellates a predicament and with Tessa's story, how it happens where things in the outer world where I feel, I mean, life is just happening, you know, there's this drunk person, there's the, there's the, the deflated, deflation and all of this happening. But as soon as I place an idea that I have of what should be happening, that is at variance with what is happening, then I've got a predicament. Um, in the outer world. And then with Jesse's story, it goes inwardly that as soon as I place an idea about what I should be doing or thinking or feeling, then the predicament is, um, appears in the, in the inner life. And I was thinking about the woman next door with the, you know, the um, incredible volume and how it's not actually in the circumstance itself because I can feel stuck in the predicament um, or free in the predicament or or like like yesterday when I first heard her voice before I could think that this shouldn't be happening it was just a familiar voice and I thought oh there's a familiar voice and I felt some kind of affection until I realized it was that woman that woman with the megaphone and um, immediately I was in you know all stations ready for the battle and at one point I even um, took out the leaf blower I didn't need to leaf blow anything, but I took out the leaf blower just to kind of give her the feeling for, like, maybe this will shut her up. Maybe she'll go inside. And I thought, surely, surely. So like 15 minutes later, I turned the leaf blower off and she's just like talking right to it. She just didn't phase her one bit. Um, and then there'll be times when I'll hear her voice and yesterday or today and there's just a feeling of um, almost like she's like the Blue Jays or the, or the Red-Shouldered Hawk. It's just this, this noise that's this annoying noise. Yes, there it is. <laughs> how, uh, how every piece of, every piece of this is all of it. You know, the bit we have right now, right now, right now, right, is all of it. 
Yeah, like each bird holds all of bird and all of life. Each, each new strange galaxy revealed by the telescopes holds all the strange mysteries of the vastness and our place in it. And is our place tiny or vast itself? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and uh, that each piece of awakening is all of awakening. So if you have this one moment of here, that it'll be enough, you know. And, uh, and I think the rest of us sort of getting more honest about do we really care what other people think of us? Do we really mind if X? Do we really mind if Y? Do we really mind if we get sick? Do we really mind if all that, you know? And so the, do we really mind if we mind, you know? So that, that freedom goes out into the stars. So thank you, it's an honor to sit together. Yeah, I'm feeling tremendous love and warmth being here together. Yeah. It's nice to have co-conspirators, you know. So <laughs> and uh, next week I'm going to do the uh, when the fire at the end of the universe comes, are we destroyed or not? Am I destroyed or not? Do I go with it or not? a great con really i suppose we could say it. for us it's probably about uh, climate change and but it's about many things it's about the fire that's always in the heart and things like that you know so that's the and then we'll move on to a different series of cons but i thought i'd give you a bit of a taste of the curriculum with three predicament cons in a row <laughs> so that we don't have to be frightened of our predicaments we can enjoy them and roll around in them like a a bear in summer pasture, like that. Jordan and Amaryllis. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Amrilis. Thank you, Michael. Uh, summertime. I, summertime is when it's, it's like a koan. You can repeat it over and over again. <laughs> and the four vowels the same. So it's lovely. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, be here next week, as I said. And we have a, a multi day retreat coming up. On, in mid-October and so join us if you want it's an online retreat so it's one of the few ones it's <clears throat> not few but it's just really available you don't even have to move out of the temple part of the temple you're in 
And if you need scholarships, then it's an easy one for us to give scholarships to because we're not renting a facility and you're in the vast uh, digital temple. So try it out. We've got a whole bunch of wonderful teachers. John Joseph is here tonight, here this afternoon. He's on, he'll be coming and uh, other people. So, um, yeah, Jesse will be here. So, so come, come to it. And if you want to give us money, PacificZen.org makes us delirious, as I said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then we pay, make our payroll, keep our webmaster, 